They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that killed the calf that ate the canary. What is true? And once again, welcome back. Hello, and welcome to the end of spring, beginning of summer, circa 2022 edition of the Dana Gould Hour podcast. Two very dear pals of mine are joining me today, Alice and Rosen of the podcast. Alice and Rosen is your new best friend is here. She's going to be talking about her new venture, Upworthy Weekly, her podcast, Alice and Rosen is your new best friend, and her podcast, Childish, with Greg Fitzsimmons, and so much more. And TV's Frank himself, from Mystery Science Theater and The Mads, Frank Conniff is here to talk about living in New York City during lockdown, having a goddamn quadruple bypass surgery, and his new book, Billy Gillis, Seven-Year-Old Screenwriter. And we'll be discussing our 300-year friendship. True Tales from Weirdsville takes a deep dive into the world of Mickey Cohen, In his day, Mickey Cohen was one of the most famous people in Los Angeles, but he was not a movie star. He was a gangster. A gangster who, at one point, as you will hear, in a court of law, brought the LAPD to its knees. Not that they were happy about it, or let the matter rest there, as you can imagine. If you enjoy True Tales from Weirdsville, you will also enjoy my newsletter, The Cinemorph. The Cinemorph is a twice-weekly column that I publish on the platform Bulletin. Just imagine miniature episodes of True Tales from Weirdsville that you do have to read yourself, delivered right to your inbox. Go to danagould.bulletin.com and subscribe. It's free and worth it. Lastly, if you live in the Denver area, Denver, Colorado, I will be returning to one of my favorite clubs in the country, the Denver Comedy Works, June 23rd, 24th, and 25th of this year, 2022. The Joyride album, featuring myself and Bobcat Goldthwait, also comes out in June on 800 Pound Gorilla, and Hanging with Dr. Z is still available for your viewing pleasure on YouTube. Season 3... It is in the works, my friend. Lastly, thank Christ, if you like the show, please consider becoming a Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet. Go to danagould.com and sign up for our Patreon. Five bucks a month gets you extra audio content, video content, and some other junk. We don't have graduated levels. Five bucks a month, and you get some stuff. Be a Sky Cadet. A simple deal for complicated times. And now, it's on to our filthy business. It's a uh, it's a surprisingly brisk day. High atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California, at Falcons Lair Recording Studios, we're talking to an old pal, a fellow podcaster. But uh, but this this young lady uh, has I just have the one that I release every three months in one nine hour episode. You have. Three or four. I'm gonna I'm gonna say them, and then you can correct me. Ooh, she love is it. the star of Allison Rosen is your new best friend. That might tip off her identity. She also is now uh, the co-host of Upworthy Weekly. Yes, and with uh, the lovely and talented Greg Fitzsimmons, you also have a book out called Tropical 
attire encouraged and other phrases that scare me. I do. Uh, uh, three, three podcasts and a book. Three yes. podcasts, two kids, and one book. You're doing great. Thank you. It doesn't always feel like it, but thank you, Dana. Yeah. If you're, uh, you're running the same race I am. It's exhausting. Just hurling as much as I can against the wall. God hope some of it sticks. And I include the kids in that. One of them will make money. Just <laughs> keep Joe, just keep going. Just keep having them. You know, I was actually thinking of you before we started. Um, despite that very nice introduction, which makes it sound like I'm a creative person doing all sorts of things, which I- I'm busy and I, well, thank you. Thank you. But I was thinking about, God, I hate to start a podcast with uh, my insecurities. I like to lead with other things. Perhaps you're, my, among, you know. you're among friends, though. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I was thinking about, you know, opportunities that, that other people get and things. And I was thinking that, like, at this point in the world and in this industry, I feel like opportunities come to people who create their own opportunities, mm-hmm. um, or at least who are creating, creating their own things and then sort of opportunities, similar opportunities find them. That is and my case for sure. Then I was thinking about you. Yeah. So. When you had that realization, did it feel like um, a happy moment or was it a, no, a moment of resignation? Was grudging and angry. I have to credit my manager, the great Tom LaSalle, uh, who said, gave me the best advice of my entire career. Be the person that hires you. Mm. And I keep coming back to it I because it was like, I just wanted to be an actor mm-hmm. who just every day, hey, can you come and do this? You go there, they put your, they hang your clothes up. <laughs> and they, right. And they walk you to where you got to go and you yeah. stand there and blather and they walk. It's just like, it's, it is like, I'd like to Here be a go, baby. Here you go, Mr. Gould. I love being a baby. <laughs> oh my, the validation you get for, yeah. not only are you swaddled, fed, loved, held, you're validated. Yeah. But in terms of my career, the way it turns out more often than not is you want to act great. Write a movie, build a camera, found a studio, <laughs> and then maybe you can act in the movie. We'll see. We'll see. Mm-hmm. But do all the other stuff. <laughs> oh, do you sometimes not even hire yourself? Oh, yeah. You know, it's not always, it's just sometimes I'm not always right for me. And uh, <laughs> no, it really is. It, 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 it's, uh, it was a very grudging kind of thing. Like, yeah, I'm just going to have to do this all myself. Mm-hmm. But in doing so, and, and you know this, uh, you're out there and your name comes up. And people go, well, what about Allison? I just saw her. At the, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the one of the jobs I have now is because the guy saw Hanging with Dr. Z on YouTube and was thinking about me. And they said, he might do this. Ask him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I've said, uh, I've boiled it down. I've boiled Tom's good advice down to something less eloquent, which is things lead to things. Right. I think that's true as well. I think you guys got to keep churning. Yeah. So I guess I actually... No word is that more true than with the ladies. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, I I had Bobcat on my show somewhat... Speaking of ladies. (laughs) My comedy wife. (laughs) Uh Somewhat recently, although in the pandemic, I don't know, it could have been three yeah. years ago. It feels recently, <laughs> but I loved, I loved uh, the documentary you guys did together. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was another example of just like, we just did it. Nobody invited us to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we just, uh, Richard Nixon once said, I just keep getting out of bed to confound my enemies. And that's kind of how I do <laughs> Oh, you think I'm done? Nah. I'm going to blow this game. But, but tell me, so um, Allison Rosen is your new best friend, um, has been, now that's, that's had a good run now. You're in what year now? So as a podcast, that one started in 2012, but I actually started that show. It started as a streaming internet show when I was living in Brooklyn. And that was in, I should really look it up. It was either 2009 or 2010. I think it was 2010. So in some iteration, it's been around since 2010, but as a podcast, 2012. So yeah, it's, um, it is, uh, got yeah, it's attitude a good, now. It's, is it it's, tween? 
Yeah, it's getting surly. It's like my youngest. <laughs> it's getting surly. Um, and uh, and 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 now tell me what is uh, what is uh, tell us about Upworthy, which is your new endeavor. Yeah, so Upworthy Weekly is a lighthearted news show which comes out on Saturdays. Um, I'm really enjoying doing it. It's my newest one. Um, it's very cute. It's still, uh, you know, very photogenic. No, I'm just kidding. Just pretending <laughs> it's a baby. Right. Um, no, it's but just it is teething. <laughs> yes, it is the it is the newest one. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with Upworthy. They have a very big social media following, and they post um, what they refer to as the best of humanity. So it's positive news stories feel good news stories. Um, Yeah. And they wanted to start a podcast and they reached out to me and I was very flattered by that. Um, And so it had been in the works for kind of a while. uh, And then we launched in November and it's just been really, it's, it's the first time I've done a podcast where I mean, I guess to a degree, the Adam Carolla show was, it was me joining something else. So it wasn't Mm -hmm. like um, it, it wasn't, sort of like Alice Rosen's new best friend and childish where it's like an idea that we came. Yeah. So that was me joining something else, but still this is the first one where it's like, we are a company and we are hiring you. Um, right, right. right. But that's always flattering. Yes. Yeah. So that's been nice. Um, and I you have do been, all these from your house. I do them all from my house. That's I actually I haven't even met in person. My co-host, he might not even have a, a body below the neck. I don't know. I think he does. <laughs> I wrote an entire pilot with a guy without meeting him. I met him wow. after. Was it awkward and weird? No, we spent every morning together, like three, four hours of a really funny comedian named Sam Morrell from New York. And uh, Oh, I've heard about, of him. Yeah, Sam's awesome. And yeah. uh, we uh, wrote a pilot together. And uh, and then I met him like two months later, like, oh, hey, you're tall. Yeah. I didn't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how tall my co-host Todd is. Yeah, the fun thing about Todd is he and I have this amazing chemistry. It's as if we've known each other for years. Um, there's a lot of things, about, like we disagree about a lot, not necessarily important stuff, but he right. hates Christmas music, but loves that Mariah <laughs> Carey song. And I'm like, that's 100% Wrong. Well, I'm the exact opposite of him. I am like you, Dana. Yeah. He's the exa- song, he's wrong. I want to die when I hear it. Yeah, that song is the it Mar- Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You is to Christmas music what Ron Jeremy is to acting. I could not agree it's more. Just everything wrong in every yes. way. <laughs> yes. What so we discussed it on the show, and what's surprising is that song has a lot of defenders. Oh, no, people love it. People In- love yeah. it. Including Bean of Kevin and Bean. Really? He reached out to tell me how re- respectfully, and I believe he literally said respectfully, how wrong I was. <laughs> I don't like any song where they over, where they add, they over sing it. Mm-hmm. All, like all is one syllable. Yeah. All, yes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. it yeah. No, it was just, just sing it. Just episode. sing it. We get it, Mariah. We mm-hmm. get it, Christina Aguilera. We get, you know, it's making me realize on this, I'm sure this is misogynist. I don't care. All those women who are like, watch me put on headphones and hold one ear and like really <laughs> sing into it and belt a song and croon and sing the crap out of this. So I don't care for any of them, really. Yeah, no, the, and then in, in that moment, they're not really singing. That's all they're showing saying. off. Right. But oh, I see what you saying. mean in that, yeah, literally yeah. in that. Yes, yes. For the, I was actually talking about this today or last night. I was talking about this with uh, your friend and mine. I'm assuming she's also your friend, Laura Keitlinger. I love her. Yeah. We had dinner last night. We went over there for dinner like adults. We went over a friend's house and uh, they um, prepared a meal. And uh, my fiance and I sat at the table. We all discussed topics and ate. And it was very adult. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Because you know, then we put it our was keys pres- in a bowl <laughs> and uh, <laughs> traded bills at the end of the night. I love it. Um, it was because you know, it was pres- preceded with they're great. We should have them over sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It Just was lovely. Could you, and but I was saying because you're talking about like upworthy, it focuses on upbeat news stories. Mm-hmm. Because I was listening to a very good podcast called Hacks on Tap. Yes, our your friend and mine, Jeff Fox, uh, writes on, uh, works yes. on. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, my my friend Mike Murphy uh, is one of the guys on that podcast. And 
they were talking about the, the rise of Ron DeSantis in Florida and how he could very well be the next president or unless Trump wants to be president. Uh, and what great and, choices. Right. And I realized that, yeah, odds are at some point in the next one or two cycles, the president is going to be someone whose who's goal is to anger me. <laughs> and that's their policy. Yeah, it's that's president about, troll. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is really, and I, I say this about the current Republican Party. Their, their main belief mm-hmm. is trolling <clears throat> Democrats. They don't yeah, really believe in anything else. Right. They, have, they have no consistent stands on anything outside of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I cannot, I will not get as invested in it as I did before because you, you're, you, you're pointless to a, you know, it's like I can't fight all day, every day. Mm-hmm. I'm well, going to vote yeah, and, and I'm going right. to vote and I'm going to donate. And then I'm going to live my life until it's time to donate and vote again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. It's like, I just can't. <laughs> You'll show I them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I mean, and it's, it's sort of a, uh, ugh. it's a real, do you curse on this one? Oh, sure. It's a real mind fuck because when their goal is to anger you and yet, and they're doing things that are very legitimately, mm-hmm. uh, you know, devilish and then you have a human reaction and then it's like oh cry more oh fuck off yeah, yeah they love it and, and the other thing is it just it's a pendulum people usually vote for the opposite of what they mm-hmm. have now right that's how we get Biden, and right. that's how we get trump that's how we get obama you know it's like uh, uh george bush was seen george bush senior was seen as out of touch mm-hmm. bill clinton seemed like a regular guy and then bill clinton seemed kind of sleazy so george w bush is super christian dude then he seemed kind of dim. So Barack Obama was a constitutional lawyer. And then he seemed kind of boring. So we get Donald Trump, who's a sideshow attraction. <laughs> then we get, you know, and then Joe Biden says, oh, good, boring again. We want boring again. Right. And, uh, but the, the view of Biden is that he's old and he's weak. So it'll be something else. Uh, you know, Jesse Ventura, I don't know what it'll be. But, uh, and then they'll get sick of him. It'll be, you know, it goes back and forth. It's never going to be all of one side. Mm-hmm. Too many people. And you absolutely have to stay involved and stay engaged. But I cannot allow myself to be overwhelmed again. No, it'll like, consume yeah, you. It'll consume yeah. you. I live with someone who is consumed by it. I was and, for four years and mm-hmm. it's not worth it. No, not for you and not for the person that you live with. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's hard. Um, but the other thing is, and then and I'll, and I'll shut up. If you don't allow them to troll you, they have nothing. Like all of these like Trump's Truth Social, I think it's called, or Parler, all these conservative Twitters, mm-hmm. they all go belly up because they're only on, because there's no liberals there for them to torture. Right. If they can't torture you, they have no purpose. Oh, that's interesting. It's like starving them of their yeah. oxygen. You just don't, don't play yeah. and they have nothing. Well, come over to Upworthy Weekly if you need something of a diversion. We're, we do occasional political stories. It's not, we are left-leaning, but not, but we have uh, listeners on both sides. Sure. Uh, and it's, it's for the most part, we stay away from politics. It's, you know, stories about dogs that rescue people Great. and stories about uh, like a mom that actually bribed her son to stay off of social media. And then we discuss <laughs> like, would you do that? And, uh, you know, like a Buddhist monk's morning routine. And oh, wow. I, that sounds fascinating. <clears throat> I bet it's really long. It's a lot of uh, chanting and being of service. Oy. <laughs> Boring. Oy. I will no say, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. When they hired Mine's me, corn muffins and anger. <laughs> when they hired me, I was a little bit like, cause they, they are a very, like their social media is very, um, earnest. And I was thinking, are they hoping to get a show that is the audio version of this social media feed? Cause are they familiar with me? That is not exactly what I am. And thankfully they were familiar with me and they were they they were you know they wanted something right. with personality and irreverence right. so I was and very happy news. yeah yeah no, yeah because I I was a little bit worried that like uh oh am I the wrong fit because you know we we will have fun with things and we like we did a story which again this is supposed to be the best of you know 
Is it a half hour, news. hour? What is the, what um, is the... It's about 50 minutes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That uh, seems to be step. the sweet spot for podcasts. Mm-hmm. Right. Which uh, is why mine is seven hours. <laughs> yeah, my, with my, all my other... Every, chi- every childish is an hour. Alice from Rosen's Junior Best Friend is like an hour and a half. I just... I know. I just read something that was saying that 45 minutes is like the sweet spot. And I'm like, mm, how about two sweet spots smushed together? Yeah. Um, or seven. This, <laughs> <laughs> how long is your show really? It usually, I do one a month that usually runs between two and a half and three hours. We did this story about, again, so it's the best of humanity, upbeat news. Uh, Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> this story about this dog's um, best, amazing last day. And it was this dog, Maggie, who loved the snow and she, <laughs> she had incurable cancer or something. Oh, no. So her owners wanted to give her a snow day for her last day and like the utah park rangers you know found a snow machine and they made her a snow pile and it was like the sweetest thing but i just kept thinking how is this upbeat i understand i know dana is crying there was a comment that was like is it possible to die of sadness (laughs) comment on the original news it was so i mean heart just tugs at your heartstrings so sweet and that's like within the upworthy wheelhouse but i just like i said about not knowing whether like are you sure you wanted me to host this just be like this is very sad yeah very sweet yeah well okay so it brings to mind something that that i was thinking about last week i went to see et et at at a film festival spielberg spoke and it was at the chinese theater and i had not seen et since it came out in 1982. Mm-hmm. And in that summer, I saw it every fucking day because I worked at the movie theater. Um, now, when you think of E.T., what do you think of? Well, I think of a lot of things. I saw it in the theater in 1982. I was sure. very young and it scared the shit out of me. Scared you? Interesting. Yes. I was a, I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... My first memory is of I think we must have been a little bit late going into the theater, and I I don't remember the movie that well. But at the beginning is very dark, and all the kids are like riding their bikes. Right? Is that the beginning? Mm-hmm. Um, so the flashlights. So, yes, and I think that kind of just scared me. The idea of being a little kid out. I mean, at that point, I right. didn't being I didn't out even, late. And I yeah yeah. I didn't trick or treat. I mean, f- right. thinking of kids trick or treating alone, I was like, they're so brave. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was very, you know, I was a scared little kid. So that, so it scared me a lot. Um, but now, yeah, I know that that, I know that E.T. gets very sickly. Well, see, that's the thing. He spent, okay, what I didn't realize about E.T. is seeing it now. It's like, it's a dark, yeah, weird It's pretty movie. sad. He spends half the fucking movie dying. And it's just My like, mother-in-law put it on for Elliot, who is five, Mm-hmm. And I had to do some loud, like, pss, 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 to my husband. Um, and, and the pss, pss was like, I don't know if this is a good choice for, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Plus, his name's uh, in the movie. So, that's yes, good. I know. Everyone thinks that. Yeah. But so, anyway, um, thankfully, Elliot kind of lost interest and then we were able yeah. to change the channel. But I was like, he's too young for this movie. And I was really surprised at how people think about, oh, it's this wonderful, no. heartwarming. No. No, it's dark. I mean, like, it's dark mm-hmm. and sad. It is dark and sad. And it was the biggest movie of all time until right. Titanic, which is also arguably dark and sad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't even know what the biggest movie is now. Uh, but it was, I was really surprised that that made more money than Star Wars. I'm trying to even. I'm trying to remember the story of E.T. Okay, so it's a bunch of kids who are out. They find this alien. They bring Mm -hmm. him home. It's a divorced family, right? Right. It's It's a broken family. The kid's lonely. There's no dad. Mm -hmm. And they befriend E.T., but E.T. wants to go home. And they hide him. And he starts to die. Right, because he's so far. The government wants him. Right. And the government also wants him. And uh, he starts to die. And he's dying because he, and he's like, what, 300 light years? Yeah, but they come back. He's he's alive at the end. He's okay. And how do they get him home? Oh, the spaceship he, comes to get him. Yeah, he creates a, a beacon and the right. ship comes back. And also and his, his fingers are very long. 
It's very great. And then Michael Jackson got involved. Yeah, I remember the posters of Michael Jackson and E.T., Alien versus Predator. Um, and, uh, but, and, and I'm just like, how did you get, leave him alone. Yeah. Can E.T. Can't have some the fame? kids have something yeah. for themselves? Do you have to get your face in everything? Right. <laughs> just right. leave E.T. alone. Right. And his creepy long fingers are magic and can heal things and light right. up. And then there but was the whole... Him. M&M's versus Reese's Pieces thing, well, That's too. the greatest. That's the part of that story that I love, is that they went to M&M and they went, no. Mm-hmm. And so E.T. ate Reese's Pieces. And, yes. was like, and then we got the excellent Mac and Me, which is the McDonald's-based spinoff of E.T., where uh, they ate McDonald's food. But it's... Uh, that, that, that one didn't... didn't early s- that one was not nearly as popular. Not even well, popular. Well worth the view. I haven't seen it. You know what I really like? Br- a it- bracing ripoff. A, like a, 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 a film that's such a ripoff, it's thrilling. <laughs> I need to watch it. I need to watch yeah. them back to back. Um, you know what I really did like? I don't like? think you need to see E.T. I think you go right to Mac and Me. <laughs> okay. Straight to Mac and Me. <laughs> I loved Short Circuit. Sure. Okay. With Johnny Five, Steve right. Gutenberg. The Goot. all I- The Goot. But Short Circuit, that was just a robot, right? No alien? Short Circuit was just a robot. Okay. Robot. And then there was Short Circuit 2. Yeah, with Fisher Stevens, I think. Yeah. That's Who a- people used to be furious with. Why? Because he was no goot? Because he was kind of a dorky looking dude. Mm-hmm. And he was married to Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, right. And it threw everybody off. It threw yes. off everybody's bell curve that she would dig a dude who looked like Fisher Stevens. I f- and, you know, and now he's on Succession. Yes. And I remember seeing him thinking, there's something vaguely hot about him. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Well, he's also one of those guys that I'm sure you see him in real life. He just looks, just looks like a guy. I I spoke to Naomi Watts for five minutes and I had no idea who it was. She just looks like a, a nice blonde lady. Hmm. You didn't and, want to immediately bed her? No, she was with a... She was... With somebody and stopped by our like group of group at we're in the concert at the Hollywood Bowl and she was with somebody and they stopped by and knew somebody they're like talking and and like two people were talking and we were both like left out of the conversation so we just started the chit chat and then they left and they I said who was that well, that was Naomi Watson and someone said what who, I was talking to Naomi Watson. <laughs> <laughs> I no Are you sure? Is there security cam footage of that? <laughs> but um, she just she just looked like a looked like a any attractive woman at the mall. You know, didn't look like a ginormous movie star. Must, so must be knows? that Hollywood magic, Dana. Some people photograph well, and other people I don't want to mention names. Dana Gould photograph like a toe. It's just <laughs> what you have. Can I tell you something insane that's only very loosely related to this, but I was thinking about it earlier because I don't know what's happening to me. Um, I have spent most of my, no offense to the people I'm about to offend. I've spent most of my life, Dana, thinking, why would anyone ever want to be a dentist or a dental hygienist? Have you also thought that? No, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. Real brief. I No, I love my dentist and I love going to the dentist because I feel like I'm being taken care of. Oh, it's the baby thing again. Oh, uh, just the childhood thing of like, I had sh- horrible teeth and they'd never take us to the dentist and I paid for it later. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Lulu, <laughs> would you get her wisdom teeth off? Out. You oh. know, we, we, we take her, we're taking her out of the dentist office. She's high as a kite, mouthful of cotton. And she's like, she's like, you're the United Brain but people hate you because you're a <laughs> dentist. <laughs> and really go, okay, let's get to the car. And she's like, who wants to be a dentist? People I hate you. <laughs> like, Come on, buddy. Come on. Let's she get was the speaking car. the truth. <laughs> she was I uh, yes. Uh, That's hilarious. Okay, so you have not So no, you don't want to so you don't understand why people would want to be a dentist. Right. I'm, I'm not assuming it pays scads. And yes. uh but outside of that, I'm not you know, it is a weird job. Well, it's just like, it's not, and it's not even the, that people hate you thing. Although, yes, um, that's also like, why would you want to be in the IRS or something? No, it's the yeah. like, why would you want to like be in someone's gross mouth. mouth all the time? Yeah, I don't get it. I yeah. don't, I'm just, even my hairdresser who I've been with, hairdresser, the woman that cuts my hair, mm-hmm. who's been cutting my hair for 20 years. Um, I wouldn't shampoo her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put my hands in your hair. Right. So, uh, been working on, you know, teeth brushing 
with my youngest son. He's three. Uh, he's four. And what did you say? <laughs> he's 40. <laughs> he's 14. <laughs> yeah, he's three. Uh, and we've gotten into a routine now where, uh, and this, he's in that age where he wants to stall bedtime. So, I'm sure, yeah, I know. Well, it's truly, there are nights where I'm like, I don't have the energy to go through right. this. I can't even. It's so exhausting. Are we still doing this dance? Yes. Cause I know <laughs> you're going to get in your crib and you're going to say, I need a toy. And then I'm going to say, what toy? And then mm-hmm. you're never going to come up with an answer, and you're going to make me show you every single thing in your room. It's just, or, uh, yeah, where you close it. I'm hungry. Is that, yeah. Is that, yeah. <laughs> well, breakfast is in a couple hours. Uh, yes. As we're reading books, he'll get off my lap and he'll go to the door and he'll turn to me and he'll go, I'll come right back. And then he'll, <laughs> he'll, he'll run. We call it jailbreak. He'll run out of the room just laughing as hard as he can. Oh my God. It's cute, but it's like dry. It's, yeah. uh, so your going son is to three send me to an early grave. He's three. So and you also have a, a five year old boy. Boy, two boys. Yeah, yeah. Two Elliot more. and Owen. Owen is the three year old. So anyway, um, he three and five. He will. Oh my lay- god. Oh my god. Three and five. Oh boy, you're busy. <laughs> they're both at the age where their job is to kill himself. Yes. If five yeah. is he in kindergarten yet? He's going to be in kindergarten in late Coming August. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I vowed that I was not going to be one of these parents who gets caught up in where he goes to kindergarten and worries about it because we're in a really good district. Yeah, we're, but if we, you pick up the wrong kindergarten, he'll, he can't go to the right grad school. But I know. <laughs> he won't get into the right cemetery. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll just have to leave him in the park and let the crows deal with it. <laughs> uh I mean, he's already enrolled in the public school. Like, that's part of why Mm -hmm. we moved here. It's done. He's going to the public school. But all of a sudden, I... I'm assuming you're somewhere out in the valley. Yeah, we're in Burbank. God's country. (laughs) That's that's what we call it. I'm suddenly so anxious that we're making a mistake. I can't believe... They got to me, Dana. They have gotten to me. It's fine. But so anyway, anyway, so Owen lays on his back and puts his head in my lap and lets me floss his teeth and brush (sighs) them. And opens his mouth. It's 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 our new routine. He's just suddenly become like very compliant. I think because he knows it tacks an extra X amount of time on before he has to go to bed. But I have begun really looking forward to it. And I like th- I think about it during the day and it fills me with these like warm, fuzzy feelings of like, oh, his little cute little teeth. Oh, and then mm-hmm. I was thinking, like, oh my God, I am in dental hygienist position. Sure. I am looking down into his mouth and I'm mm-hmm. enjoying cleaning it. Now, granted, you dental hy- dental hy- yeah, dental hygienists don't work on, don't only work on their adorable children right. who like at most have, you know. Nugget chicken nugget residue in their yeah, mouth or something. Yeah. But at some point you gotta you find yourself like t- training on Andy Dick's teeth, <laughs> and you gotta deal with oh whatever God. comes out of that. Oh God, um, right. But still, I was like, oh, I actually, I can't believe it. I actually get it. Like that that feeling of satisfaction of you know, like like detailing a car or something. Yeah, probably. I get it. Now, does he go to? Preschool? He does. He goes to preschool. So it'll be an easier transition to kindergarten. It's still a sad day. It'll be a sad day. Yes. I did not anticipate how awful Uh leaving my daughter at college would be. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say kindergarten. I'm like, I'm not ready for something like that yet. No. I was like, that would be fine. We'll go up to college and get a plasma. No, no, no. It is (laughs) awful. How... Is she going somewhere far away? She's in Berkeley. Okay. Uh, but it's still, it's like... Yeah. And her sister's going to go, starts in the fall at uh, U, Wisconsin, and Madison. Um, but you you go, and when you like, get them set up in their little mm-hmm. apartment, mm-hmm. you know, the dorm room, and then meet right. the roommate, and, and you're getting ready to leave, and you're like, oh, I have no more purpose yeah. in life. Uh Thank God I had to do, do more at home, but I was like, because I know Greg Fitzsimmons is going through this. Yes, we've talked like, about this on Childish. Yeah, I, I have no reason to be alive anymore. I have, there's nothing for me to do. Mm-hmm. It's yes. puppy rescue time. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, what he, do I do? Right. He talked about, um, so we do this thing, highs and lows, which... uh 
It's very high. It's very high concept. Um, it's, I don't know if you can follow the gist of it, but what is it? Oh uh, yeah, I'm gonna. How long do you? I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I need got a thing for you to look at. Um, but anyway, his low was one week was visiting Owen, his Owen, which is his older son in Chicago, and getting in the car. And he either did cry or almost cried because he realized like it just how many months it was going to be until he saw him again. Yeah, he's really he's he has actually made me realize that I am in co- probably like one of the best times of parenthood, even though it's hard. Like, oh, this you is are. really the prime time. Oh, and, you are. And it's very it's it's oh, been yeah. a nice got, wake up call. Like, you've I, got this 10 is really years, the best time. 10 years of trick or treating. In front. Yeah, that's the that's when I always look at. You've got 10 years of truth. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's, you're in heaven, right? Now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's, 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 um, are you a person who's good at being in the moment? I'm going to guess no. No, but I, with my kids, mm-hmm. I do, I am, uh, for whatever reason, my neuro, there's a, there's a, there's an eye to the hurricane of my neuroses. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm, uh, very, uh, I enjoy, I really enjoy my kids. Mm-hmm. I'm sure most people do enjoy their kids as well. But I'm able to prioritize my time with them and, and put aside my other stuff with them because I'm doing something. Right. I'm being it's it's an active thing. I'm mm-hmm. being a parent. I'm right. doing my job. And I'm very much a workaholic, but I view that as also part of my job. It's like my parenting is is not something that is sacrificed. Because of my workaholic tendencies, it is highlighted by that. It's like, mm-hmm. no, this is my most important job. Right. That makes yeah. sense. So, yeah. but it's hurt now because, like, my youngest is thirteen, and you know, we we drive we drive to school in the morning every morning, and sometimes she just doesn't want to talk. <laughs> sometimes she just wants to listen to uh, TikTok radio in which every song has the F word. Every single song. But you didn't used to write songs. Didn't used to have the F word in them, Mm-mm. and now they all do. Mm-hmm. Whatever happened, whatever happened is just wanted to hold her hand. Why, why, why? Now you have to fuck their hand. Why? <laughs> hey, it's a safer thing to fuck. Um, <laughs> wait, when you say TikTok radio, are you, do you mean TikTok or is there actually a TikTok radio? No, there's radio? a TikTok radio station on Sirius. And, I did not uh, know that. And it's filthy. What is it? It's just a name of a station. And I guess it's songs that get played a lot on TikTok. Oh. And, uh, but like, I should not, a man at my age, I have a, a, pretty facile knowledge of what teenage girls listen to. <laughs> like I can Tate McRae, Doja Cat. Like I know all these people. Look at that. Uh, Olivia Rodrigo, mm-hmm. Tay Tay. Uh, I know what they're all up to. Yeah. There are songs that I only know because they're, I've only heard snippets of them on TikTok. They're probably sure. played on this TikTok radio. Yeah. So yeah. wait, your older one, how many years apart are your older ones? One. Just 18, one. I have 18, 19, 13. 18, 19, 13. Okay. Because just today I was thinking, because I've always prided myself on, but it's a silly thing to pride yourself on, but like on the two years apart, like that, that is a very desirable age difference. Like that, we nailed that. Yeah. I mean, and I did. Yeah, no, IVF, it was good. So it's very There good. was like, there was science yeah, was involved. Sometimes in. they're, sometimes they're two years and seven, you know, there's, there's the space between the birthdays. Right. Um, they're, so, uh. Oh, I see. Yeah, with yours. So are, April, are they? They're, they're one year apart, three months a year. But in terms of school, are they one year apart? Yeah. Right. So I was, but today I was like, I should. We should have spaced it out more because <laughs> they're going to be gone. At the, it's going to feel like the same time. That's what I started right. thinking about. Yeah, because Alice is, you know, she has a car and goes to school, and like we, she, she kind of she sleeps here, mm-hmm. but she just kind of comes and goes, and. uh you know, she went to Coachella with her friends and um, she's like, I don't want to know what she did at Coachella. <laughs> <laughs> did she seem oh to my have God. fun? Harry Styles was singing and we were crying. I'm like, yeah, because you were on Molly. That's why you're crying. Because <laughs> you made MDMA in the car. That's why you're crying. <laughs> Harry um, Styles, but, a song that I've only ever heard on TikTok. Yeah, see, I, I believe... Olivia Wilde is adopting him. Is that what the story is? Oh, really? I think that she was served papers on stage. Yeah, it was his adoption papers. That's what it was. <laughs> um, no, so but so I was thinking about this. What year did you start college? Ninety-seven. Okay. Um, eighteen ninety-seven. Eighteen ninety-seven, and you you went far away from 
Did you go local or did you I went split? to Pomona College, which is in Claremont, California. So right. it was but you only grew up, but you were from at that Orange, point you were living in Orange County. Okay. Yes. So not, so not that, that bad. Not that far. I intended to go farther away. Um uh-huh. I wanted to go to like an East Coast school or I actually thought I wanted to go to Reed up in Oregon. Sure. Um, I My daughter always went to Reed. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Uh, I went up and I did one of the prospective student weekend kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone there was, they didn't seem that happy and they all had plans of where they were going to transfer. So I came home and I was like, that was a, that was a weird experience. I still, in my head, I think I still want to go, but it doesn't but no one seemed to really like it. And then my mom really encouraged me to look at Pomona, which I had never heard of. And I was like, I'm not going to a school that's an hour and 15 minutes away called Pomona that I've never heard of. And she's like, just look at it. And I went and I looked at it. I mean, it's a very good school, even though many people have not heard of it. Um, I looked at it and, and I just loved it. And then I did early decision there and I went there and it was, I had a great time there. Yeah. Yeah, and I actually am glad I didn't go that far when I think back on really who I was at that age, even though I wanted to be someone who was ready to go very far. That's that's a thing that you go through that I have to remind myself of. Like when all of my all of my kids at this point with their mm-hmm. ages now, I'm always like, remember myself at that age. <laughs> They're all doing a hundred times better than I did. Mm-hmm. All of them, you know. They're a hundred times more together than I was at any of their ages. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's like, you're just a jerk. (laughs) (laughs) You just, you just are. You're a jerk. You're a teenager. I mean, even if you're not mean, you're just like, nothing's formed. Your, your brain's not formed. Your opinions aren't formed. Just a jerk. Yeah. So do you have do you have specific memories of that summer? Like, I'm, did you feel like it was? Did you feel like that summer was a transitional period for yourself, or were you going so close to home? Like, eh. Yeah, I felt a little bit like I was neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like some That's a good of description the well, first of all, just lo- just practically logistically, it's a very short summer. Because high right. schools get out later than colleges, and college starts earlier than mm-hmm. high than high yeah, school. It's two so, months. It's two right. Months so it's months. a two month summer. Um, and I just remember a lot of the people that I was meeting and hanging out with. If it, if they were new people, it was the the feeling that I'm not going to be here for that. You know, sort of. I don't want to compare myself to someone that I'm not worthy of comparison to. But let's say you're like a military person stationed somewhere, you know, and you're having mm-hmm. a fling or something. Not that I was really having a fling, but emotionally I was. Mm-hmm. I was having emotional flings with people that weren't aware that I was having emotional flings with them. Understood. But I was having emotional flings with people I was meeting. But in my mind, it was like, but this can't continue because I'm off to college and that's very important <laughs> and I'm important. Yeah, but yeah, then yeah. The, my emotional flings did persist and I remember remember when I started, uh, for whatever reason, my landline in my dorm room mm-hmm. wasn't able to be connected. And the, you know, whoever you call cam- campus security engineer or whatever, like couldn't get it set up for the first year. So I'd go out into the pay, no, pay phone. Maybe it was pay phone. Maybe you had to dial nine to get out. I don't know, the phone in the hall. And I call up my crush back home. Mm-hmm. That's, I was still, you know, emotionally connected to him. Sure. Um, and he was a guy who fixed cars. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He just wasn't he had done a little bit of community college he was older yeah um your you know, parents it, wouldn't have been thrilled no if you bet the farm on guy. this guy right no they would still fixing cars you know i don't know what he's doing he still lives in the same town well that's all i need to know yeah all i need to know he had very long hair back then and he has short hair now well, so he has also transformed Trump supporter problem. God, I hope not. But maybe, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very attractive. Like a like a long hair. Like I'm just going to pull a name out of thin air. Gunner Nelson. Yes. Got it. Interesting know that you went it, with Gunner, not look. not Matthew. Gunner's right. the pull. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was going to say Sebastian. we all know what member of Nelson matters. <laughs> Poor Matthew. I was going to say Sebastian <laughs> Bach. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. That kind of, and it was like it was blonde like that too. And when someone would call his name, this is a, I'm gonna have to describe it. 
instead oh, of I, I already know what's going to happen. Okay. He would turn and it would be like a Breck commercial. Oh, no, that would be amazing. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't yes and you. I believe this was why I was, no, I was going to say this is why I was fired from a f- past job. It's not not the real, I don't believe the real reason. Anyway, no, that's what you would think. That would be majestic. No, he was worried about breakage because it his hair wasn't, it was long but not majestic. So you would call his name and instead of turning his neck, he would turn his whole upper body. <laughs> it so was as, the exact so opposite to, of what I thought. Yes. So as not to potentially cause abrasions in the hair. <laughs> just, he, was, he would wow. swivel. So he was just like a dude with long hair. He was very cognizant of his He wanted tresses. to protect it. Yeah. Yeah. This was oh. pre-TikTok. So he didn't, he didn't, there weren't like a thousand videos on how to care for his curly hair. Which oh no, seemed none wavy. of that's good. And none of, nothing that you just described is good. No. I just remember that summer. Uh, one, I was, a, I worked at the drive-in and it was the best year for, it was the best summer for movies in human history. It was like E.T. for me, I was like E.T., Poltergeist, Star Trek II, John Carpenter's The Thing, Blade Runner, Rocky Three, Tron, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Like all those movies came out that summer. It was just like an insane level of movie quality. And my friends, I lived in a small town in Massachusetts. All we did was go to the movies mm. because one of those deaths I'll do and two, we got in free because I worked at the drive-in. And what I love about that drive-in is when I go back to visit my family, I still get in free. They know a, you still? As a past employee. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wait, <laughs> do they know you though? Or do you have to s- announce that you're a past employee? No, they, they, um, uh, I would pay if they didn't let me in, but they, I, apparently they know who I am and they let me in. I That's think because I'm like sweet. a famous person from the town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not all the time, but sometimes they just go, oh, go on in, um, which I kind of love. And, um, but yeah. And then at the end of the summer, it, it is vaguely sad. Mm-hmm. Like I remember my daughter last summer drove DoorDash mm-hmm. and I would go with her because I didn't want to drive around alone and go into the strange apartment buildings and stuff. Yeah. Um, what was her? And, oh, go ahead. Oh, just like, and we would drive around and listen to the radio and, and, um, uh, shoot the shit and she's super funny and uh we had the best time but i had the best time and she had a lot of she's not a, in the business at all but she like she had songs that like doordash songs like she had a song called single person sad meal sad person single meals <laughs> 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 and she's just like oh no, no, no. salad for wendy's on a tuesday at 10 this isn't gonna be good <laughs> like she could, you know, she would um, and we had a great time, but then it was it's just like sad. It was like, oh, this is, you're leaving. Yeah. Oh, you're leaving. Awful. Yeah. Oh, my brain's up. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I know that it was hard on my mom. Um, cause I'm her oldest and yeah, it's the first one is you get yeah. full, full force. Right. So I know that it was real hard on her. She like went nuts with, uh, <laughs> she talked to, uh, a, I had a friend who was a year older who had gone to call a different college, but that mom, you know, gave her some tips and one was like, kids steal everything. So she like went nuts with a Sharpie and put my name on everything, which was <laughs> off. It was awful. It was so, it was, I just, it was embarrassing. Back yeah. of your underwear. <laughs> she actually did put my, I mean, this is a story I've told on other podcasts, um, but she did put my name in my underwear. And I said to her mom, if that gets separated from me, I don't know that I want it traced back to me. And then, okay, I'll try to make it fast because oh, it tra- it goes back to this guy with the hair. So, Uh-oh. oh my God. Okay. This is a, it's emotional. I'm so emotionally scarred from this, even though I really, it's been so many years. I need to get over it. Okay. So I, that summer, was it that summer? I uh, had started playing guitar and took guitar lessons. I was super into playing guitar. And this guy also played guitar. And so we would get together and we would like buy guitar magazines and, <clears throat> you know, with the tablature in them. We were a couple of cool dudes. And so we'd play. So anyway, uh, <laughs> he had the fly, like the flying V, which is the guitar that Lenny sure, Kravitz yeah, has. Of course. Yeah. Um, it was also, bo- also Bob Mould from Who's Who at yeah. the Flying V. Yeah, there you go. So anyway, um, I had, uh, I don't know, some issue of, I think it had like the, the tablature to a Blind Melon song or something. And I had come home from college and hung out with him and we had, you know, uh, played this song and I had left the magazine there. He lived at home, by the way. So, um, <laughs> and with okay. his conditioner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I had been at my parents as well. I don't know why I had... I mean, I do, but I don't. I have theories about why I might have had an extra pair of underwear with me. What the the more socially uh, acceptable reason is that I was doing laundry and like clung to something. Mm-hmm. The more embarrassing reason is that uh, you were afraid you were going to be on a date. One thing would lead to another, and the next thing you know, you poop your pants. <laughs> No, I like that. I like that hopeful idea that I was like someone who might have sex. No, it was a couple more years until that was going to be happening. Um, no, I, I just, I was a, I was a heavy flow gal. <laughs> and so it might have been a heavy flow time. And so sure. I just was like, I'm going to stuff this into the bottom of my purse. Forgot that it, uh, was tagged. So anyway. So that happens. I go back to college. Da, da, da. Um, and then I realize I've left my precious issue of, Guitar player magazine at a house. I call his mom. And there's answers. no way to get another a, issue. Another issue of this magazine. Well, I had a crush well, on him. Well, if it, 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 sure, sure, sure. Uh, any sure, excuse, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I call his mom. Answers, and I he sh- oh he's not home now. <laughs> Can I take a message? Oh yeah, just let him know I left. Oh my god, I'm gonna I want to die. I just let him know I left something at his house. I want to see if I can pick it up. <laughs> I don't even say it's the magazine. Ugh. Oh, anyway, I'm... so I swing by when I'm in town to pick it up. He comes to the door with his like, you know, n- uh, immobile neck and back. And he's like, hey, uh, that that thing you did last time that really embarrassed me. And I was like, what? Like, I love you. I would never do anything to em- I didn't say this, but I'm thinking like sure. I would never do anything to embarrass you. The last thing I would ever do is I would I would throw myself on a whoopee cushion to save you. I love you. <laughs> like I would never. You know, I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, that that thing you left here. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he I mean, he he will not say what it is. And I'm like, you're being really weird. But I would not, I would not do anything to embarrass you. Are you sure it was me? He's like, yeah, it was you. And I say, and he's like, and my brother found it. (sighs) (laughs) You think, what is so upsetting about it? Yeah. Sure, guitar player. Right. Or his mom found it. I don't know. I can't, but, and I'm like, how do you know it was mine? And he's like, because there was something written on it. And so then I'm like, did someone forge? And I'm not even thinking of the magazine. I'm like, did someone forge a note from me and leave it behind? And this is taking forever. And then he yeah, goes, yeah, yeah. he's really milking this. He's like, why don't, and by the way, he's like, has the door open a crack and he's just talking through the crack at me. I mean, I'm not even in the house. He's like, he's like, why don't you go back to college and call me and we'll talk about it. I'm like, oh my God, what a dick. Yeah. It didn't seem like a dick move at the time. Uh, but I'm like, okay. So I, that's a dick move. Yeah. Oh me. yeah. Get back to school. I call him. I mean, and it's getting dragged out still. Right. And then finally, I'm like, could you just give me the initials of what it is? And he goes, U or L or P. And I'm like, and suddenly I figure it out. And I'm like, I have no idea how this happened, though. What's L? Lingerie. Oh, gosh. (laughs) And so I go, I say, well, clearly you don't want to tell me. So I think I should just go because I'm like, I need to go crawl up my own asshole. Like, I want to die. I want to die. (laughs) And he goes, wait, what do you think it is? And I'm like, I left my underwear at your house. And he's like, yes. His his mom thought that I must have hooked up with his brother or they thought that somehow they had fallen off of me, like through my jeans. I mean, through my jeans. It made no sense. Um, (laughs) clearly I haven't even finished processing it. I'm so like, and then he was like, I, what did he he say? Like something like, you know, I hope you didn't want them back. Cause I, like, I don't still have them or I'm like, I don't even, I don't Well, well, there's the mystery. Where are they? Is is eBay a thing yet? Where where are these? Well, here's the thing. I know. And I was always like, I don't even know what condition. I mean, they were clean, but like, I don't know what condition they were in. They were probably like gross They were spare spare underwear in case you needed a pair of underwear. Yeah. They weren't. So they weren't snazzy, cute underwear, Dana. They were gross underwear. They were cheap, gross underwear. Right. Where where, where would he put them? (laughs) I don't have them anymore. (laughs) I don't know. You'll have to go over. You'll have to. In a yeah. time capsule? I don't they'll have know. To go, they'll have to go to France. <laughs> you know where they are. The funny yeah, thing. Yeah, that's what I didn't understand. His mom probably thought I was calling to collect my underwear. Ew. Yeah. 
I want to die still. Just buy another pair. And do you still avoid these people when you visit your mom? So he was friends with my neighbor that lived up the street. And I did, I, I did avoid him for years and years and years. I was like friendly with the neighbor. Um, and, but like I said, this particular guy, we recently reconnected on Facebook. We don't talk about the underwear. <laughs> uh-huh. It's, it's, it has not come up. Well, my mother still hasn't spoken. <laughs> I know. She's been so totally silent. I, and by the way, I was like angry at my mom for so long about that still. I was like, she is the one who caught it. But then a yeah, friend of, I was talking to- It is your to, mom's fault. That, are you saying that? I have time with you on that. No, Thank I, you. it is. I actually felt that way. Because you could was, deny it without- with, Right. Let, unless you were like, who's our awesome? What kind of <laughs> Swedish tart are you doing? <laughs> but then I was talking to a, yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine like years later, because like I said, this was like a hugely- this was a big event in in my uh, list of humiliating events in my life. And he was like, but even if your name wasn't in them, you still would have left them there. But as you point out, I could have denied it. Ugh. Right, right. I'm sorry I had to drag everyone through that. It was just... No, it was great. It was great. That was what happened But it worked summer. out well. That's, it worked out well. How so? Because I have three podcasts you're and success. two children. You're a success. He's still back in uh, yeah. somewhere counting? in the O.C.? With my underwear, probably. Tustin. I'm going to Tustin. Close to Tustin. Mm hmm. Tustin adjacent? Mm hmm. Probably. Actually, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know specifically what city, but he's still back there mm -hmm. where it sucks. Right. And you're, you flew the coop. That's you right. Made it for yourself. <laughs> I and got now it you're out. sitting, yeah, now you're sitting pretty with, the, with your kids. And you know what? Your kids' underwear could be anybody's. I will not put their name in it. That's what I've learned. Yeah. I mean, it was a hard. Lesson to learn, but that's what I've learned. And and yeah. for anyone out there, don't or do it. Just put like A Hitler and just like, yes. you know. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. C Manson. N Watts. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to I'm going to buy some women's underwear, right? C Throne on and just leave them in my house. <laughs> yeah. So people can find them. Yes. Um, so tell the people, uh, tell everybody uh, what podcasts, uh, uh, again, where they can Tank up on Allison Rosen. Please subscribe to all of my podcasts. Allison Rosen is your new best friend. No, is that on the network or is that just your? It's just me. Just yes. you. All, all my things are just me. Is Commander for, Fox still working on that podcast? Um, so he is not my regular producer anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony Thaxton is. But Tony right. is the drummer of a band called Motion City Soundtrack. And they're going on tour. And Jeff is going to be filling in for a, a few mm -hmm. months. And I'm very excited to have Jeff back in the yeah. saddle. Um so, uh, yeah, so Alice Rose is your best friend comes out Mondays and Thursdays and then childish Mondays and Thursdays. Yeah. It's two months worth of podcasts in a week. It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. lot, Dana. It's a lot. It's a yeah. Lot. Um, it's a little much. That's the feedback I get. I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Um, and then Childish with Greg Fitzsimmons. That's every other Wednesday. Every other uh, Wednesday. And then Upworthy Weekly with Todd Perry. And that is uh, every Saturday. And you can get all of those wherever you get your podcasts. Follow me on social media at Allison Rosen. And then I've started a newsletter, uh, which I've been having a ton of fun writing that. So if you would like my words delivered straight to your... Uh, straight to your mailbox. Mailbox. Sometimes your promotions tab, although I think it's now just Is this just like going... Bulletin? Are you on Bulletin? Is that a thing? No. Is? is that a thing? It is. I'm not on... What happens there? Bulletin is uh, of like a form of Substack. It's like a Substack, oh. but not Substack. Well, this is I'm Substack. On. Okay, well then you have Substack. All right, so you're on, you're on the better version of Bulletin. Yeah. Are you on? But you do Bulletin. I'm on Bulletin. Yes, I have a, a newsletter called The Cinemorph, which is just weird stories about obscure movies twice a week. Well, you do that twice a week. Mm -hmm. well, about see, a thousand words. Look at that. Well, it's I a do lot. Yeah, it's a well, I got to subscribe to that. Well, this is just Substack. It's just alisonrosen.substack.com if you want to subscribe. It's not as frequent as Dana's. Uh-huh, I understand. I The way to do it is you you have to talk it. Oh, that's smart. And then email it to yourself and rewrite it. Oh, that's so smart. And you save money. You save time. And it makes it a little more. That's so smart. I got to go read your, I got to find out what bulletin is. Go to danagould.bulletin.com and you'll see for yourself. I can't wait. They're true tales from Weirdsville. Tales from Weirdsville. And they're true. Can 
your heart stand the shocking fact. Los Angeles is a town full of famous people, but not all of them are in show business. In the first part of the 20th century, some of the most famous people in Los Angeles were criminals. You know, gangsters. Old school, hat wearing, Tommy gun toting gangsters. Case in point Mickey Cohen. Mickey Cohen, mob enforcer grown mob boss, extortionist, murderer. Mickey Cohen, L.A. celebrity. He was the toast of the town and one day, in a Los Angeles courtroom, brought the LAPD to its knees. That is, of course, just part of the story. He was born in Brooklyn in 1913. His father died when he was two months old, leaving his Russian-born mother, Fanny, alone with five, count them, five kids. When Mickey was three years old, Fanny, who must have been an incredibly strong woman, moved the family to Los Angeles. Mickey and his brothers were street kids. Mickey especially hated school and worked selling newspapers. He didn't have a paper route, mind you. He was one of those kids you see in old movies standing on the street corner. Extra, extra, read all about it. That was Mickey Cohen. But even at that young age, he started helping his brother sell papers at the age of four. He was already running a racket, trading newspapers he should have sold for hot dogs and candy. He was not a great student, but he was a born extortionist. One of his first scams was harassing the neighborhood barber to the point that the man paid him to stay away from him. He assaulted a police officer at the age of seven, but a relative placed a call and made the charges go away. That was not the last time this would happen. Mickey led a charmed life when it came to evading responsibility for his outrageous actions. Mickey did end up doing a stint in reform school after attempting to rob a local movie theater box office with a baseball bat. A condition of his release mandated that he be placed in the Big Brother program. Mickey's big brother was a guy named Abe Roth. Abe Roth was a boxing referee, and Abe saw potential in Mickey in the ring. Before you know it, Mickey had relocated to New York and was training at Lou Stillman's gym. Mickey liked boxing, but he was already developing an acute case of germophobia. After each bout, he would spend hours in the shower, washing and washing and washing. Instead, Mickey's attention was drawn to the mobsters who ran the rackets around boxing. The three biggest mobs in New York at that time were the Italian mobs, the Jewish mob, and the Irish mob in that order. And they all worked together in a suspicious and somewhat uneasy alliance. Other cities were not so forward-thinking. Take a city like, say, Cleveland. Cleveland was run by the Italian mob. And if you weren't Italian, you weren't in the mob. It was just that simple. So Mickey, Jewish, moved to Cleveland to get his criminal career started. When the mob turned up his nose at him, referring to him as Jew Boy, Mickey decided to go into business for himself. By now, it was the Depression, so Mickey got himself a little crew together and became a stick-up man, or a rooter, as it was called back then. The mob did not appreciate this, but for some miraculous reason, again, for Mickey, the fix was always in, the mob did find it Somewhat amusing, you know, just the balls on this guy. So the Cleveland mob made him an offer. He was free to operate as long as he stayed away from any mob-controlled joints. Additionally, they threw him a small retainer that made him available to them to do outside jobs now and again, mainly brutalizing and killing people. One of his first jobs was to kill a guy who was going into business for himself without the permission of the Italian mob. Now, granted, that was exactly what Mickey had done, but what can I tell you? Mickey, of course, killed the wrong guy. Then he turned around and held up a popular restaurant that was located, hey, what do you know, directly across the street from the police station. The mob went to work on the only witness, and again, Mickey, unfeasibly lucky, skated on both mistakes. The mob let him off the hook for killing the wrong guy, and the police failed to convict him for the holdup. 
But things were now very, very hot for Mickey in Cleveland. So he moved on to Chicago, Illinois, then under the control of one Al Capone. Mickey's first job in Chicago was to protect a Jewish-controlled gambling operation. The joint was being squeezed by three local operators working for themselves, as it were. One day, when they approached the building, Mickey dealt with the situation subtly by shooting them dead in the street before they reached the door. He was promptly arrested for murder. But this was Al Capone's Chicago. And the next morning, a phone call was made and Mickey was released from jail. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, a mobster named Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was making a name for himself. He needed muscle. So Chicago sent out the muscliest muscle they had, Mickey Cohen. Mickey was supposed to get in touch with Siegel upon his arrival in L.A., but instead, he decided to do something stupid. He formed a small crew again and started robbing places. Stores, brothels, restaurants, you name it. Then he robbed a bookie joint that was under mob control. That was that. Mickey got a phone call. Siegel wants to see you. Mickey Cohen went to meet Bugsy Siegel at the Hollywood YMCA. Siegel was irate, but contained. He scolded Mickey for not reporting to him upon his arrival and told him to kick back the money he had stolen from the bookie joint. Mickey refused. Siegel insisted. Mickey told Siegel to go fuck himself. Normally, that would have been a death sentence. But again, for some reason, Mickey Cohen lived under a lucky star. Instead of killing him on the spot, Siegel had Mickey thrown in jail for two weeks. No charges. He just sat in a cell for two weeks and had himself a little think. Then, just like that, he was released and returned the money and went to work for Bugsy Siegel. After narrowly escaping death, one of Mickey's first jobs was to inform a local bookmaker named Eddie Niels that Bugsy Siegel wanted to be his new business partner. The problem was, Eddie Niels didn't want a new business partner. Not taking the hint, Mickey began robbing Eddie Niels' operations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Neal still didn't take the hint. So Niels hired an Irish hitman named Jimmy Fox to talk to Mickey. At their official meet, Mickey shot Fox point-blank upon his arrival. Miraculously, he survived and refused to press charges. Mickey walked. What? Mickey settled into L.A. quite comfortably, but his boss, Bugsy Siegel, had an itch. A very expensive itch. The Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. Siegel was a visionary, but he was no builder. The original budget for the Flamingo Hotel was $1.2 million. By the time it opened, that budget had ballooned to something over $5 million. $5 million of the mob's money that Siegel was spending. And the mob backing the hotel kept trying to reel Bugsy in. But it proved futile. So one night, while Bugsy sat on the couch reading the newspaper... Someone walked up to his living room window and put a bullet through his right eye. And then they put eight other bullets in other places. And that was the end of Bugsy. That's all, folks. This left Mickey Cohen one of the top gangsters in Los Angeles. And things were looking up for Mickey in all sorts of ways. He was getting married to a dance instructor and part-time model named LaVon Norma Weaver. He built his new bride a house in the fashionable West L.A. neighborhood of Brentwood. The problem was, the phone lines were installed by the LAPD. In fact, Mickey's new house was chock full of hidden microphones and recording equipment. Enter Jimmy Voss. Jimmy Voss was an independent contractor who installed, hey, what do you know, wiretapping devices for the LAPD. But the LAPD didn't pay much, and they treated him like shit. Hey, what a shock. One day, Voss got a call from a mutual friend who said that somebody wanted to meet him, and it could lead to a business opportunity. Voss took the meeting and found himself face-to-face with the number one gangster in Los Angeles. Voss, I understand you're the man who planted a microphone in my home for the police department. Voss was very relieved to not have been that man, as was Mickey Cohen. But Voss did say he could find all of the bugs for a price. 
And so Jimmy Voss entered a double life, working for both Mickey Cohen and the people trying to nail Mickey Cohen. This would have huge consequences for both parties and involve someone you had no idea was a part of this story. You see, one of the taps that Voss had installed was on the phone of Brenda Allen. Brenda Allen was one of the most successful madams in Los Angeles, operating a ring of call girls that numbered over 100. The tap that Voss placed on Allen revealed that she was carrying on an affair with Sergeant Elmer Jackson, assistant to Lieutenant Rudy Wellpot. Remember that name, Wellpot. Because Rudy Wellpot was the head of LAPD's administrative vice department. That's the department in charge of policing people like, well, Brenda Allen. You see, the LAPD at that time was as crooked as hell. And one of the ways in which they were crooked was to extort protection money from the people they were in charge of policing. People like Brenda Allen. Another person they then tried to extort was Mickey Cohen. The advice had been pushing Mickey. Officers would eat lavish dinners at restaurants they knew Mickey frequented, and when they were finished, would tell the management, send the bill to Mickey Cohen. At one point, leaning on him hard, they arrested one of Mickey's top henchmen, Happy Meltzer. Mickey had had enough, so he arranged a meet with Wellpot and Jackson of the LAPD advice squad. The two police officers named their price the payoff they expected Mickey to make to get them to back off. And Mickey refused. All he wanted was their offer, because he got it on tape. At the trial of Happy Meltzer, Mickey Cohen produced the tapes, and the resulting firestorm brought forth a grand jury investigation that resulted in perjury indictments for Wellpot, Jackson, Assistant Police Chief Joseph Reed, and Los Angeles Chief of Police Clements B. Horrell, who then retired. The LAPD had pushed Mickey Cohen. Mickey Cohen called their bluff and won. But don't think for a minute that the LAPD was going to let that ride. The Los Angeles Police Department, the Justice Department, everyone with a badge wanted to get Mickey Cohen. And they went at him the same way they went at his old boss, Al Capone. His taxes. Mickey was indicted on income tax evasion with a reported $156,000 unpaid tax bill. That's a little over $2 million today. To his astonishment, for the first time ever, the fix was not in. Mickey got five years in addition to having to pay that tax bill. And his time in prison was not fun. Federal officials went out of their way to make it as miserable as possible. Jail is hard enough for a germaphobe used to taking three or four showers a day and washing their hands incessantly. Mickey had no hot water and was held in solitary confinement. He was only allowed two visitors, his wife and... The Reverend Billy Graham. Billy Graham was then at the very start of his career. Graham met Mickey through Jimmy Voss, who had since renounced his wicked ways and given his life over to Christ through the good Reverend. Billy Graham told Time Magazine, I'm praying that after Mickey Cohen has paid his debt to society, he will give his heart and his life to Christ. He has the makings of one of the greatest gospel preachers of all time. Can't argue that. He could shovel it with the best of them. Mickey did his time and left prison determined to never return. Back in L.A., the LAPD landed on him like a ton of bricks, openly harassing him. At one point, he was driving through downtown L.A. when the car in front of him stalled. He stopped his car and the police cited him for causing a traffic jam. He refused to sign the citation, so they booked him. Old habits die hard, and soon Mickey was, incredibly stupidly, back in the rackets. But by now, he was as much of a celebrity as he was a gangster. At one point, Mickey got a call from Harry Kahn. Different spelling, no relation. Harry Kahn was the notoriously unpleasant head of Columbia Pictures. Kahn had a problem. 
He had a big star on his hands, Kim Novak. And Kim Novak had a boyfriend, Sammy Davis Jr. But Kim Novak was white, and Sammy Davis Jr. wasn't. And that was a problem to Harry Kahn. So he called the most famous underworld figure in Los Angeles, Mickey Cohen, and asked Mickey for a small favor. Could he please murder Sammy Davis Jr.? Mickey, to his credit, was horrified. But Mickey did see that someone spoke to Sammy, and not long after, Davis Jr. and Novak were Splitsville. And Sammy, out of the blue, married Lorray White, a black showgirl whom he had only recently met. Another celebrity encounter close to Cohen's orbit was, if anything, creepier. One of Cohen's goons was a tall, good-looking guy named Johnny Stompanato, or Johnny Stomp. Johnny Stomp was dating Lana Turner. He was also regularly beating the shit out of Lana Turner. One day, Lana's daughter, Cheryl Crane, had had enough and stabbed him to death. But it was always, always, always the money. In 1961, Mickey was back in court for income tax evasion. This time, he got a $30,000 fine and 15 years in prison. On August 14th, 1963, Mickey was relaxing in a prison rec room, just watching TV, when a fellow inmate with a severe mental disorder, Estes McDonald, ran into the lounge and attacked Mickey savagely with a three-foot-long lead pipe. Mickey sustained significant brain damage, resulting in his limbs becoming paralyzed and his speech significantly slurred. Brain surgery restored the use of one arm, and physical therapy taught him how to walk again with the assistance of a cane. Mickey was released from prison in January of 1972 into a world he no longer recognized. His beloved Sunset Strip, once a haven for well-dressed gangsters and snazzy nightclubs, now belonged to rock clubs and hippies. Mickey, suffering stomach cancer, died in his sleep in July of 1976, leaving behind a paltry sum of $3,000, which the federal government promptly took. And as for the LAPD, well, they never had a problem ever again. All of the information in this piece comes from John Bunton's brilliant book, L.A. Noir, available on Amazon. L.A. Noir was adapted into the television series Mob City, written and directed by Frank Darabont, and that is available on Apple TV and Amazon Prime. And now... On with the show. It's a beautiful sunny day high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California. And I'm talking via technology to a friend of mine who lives in New York City. But uh, we first met in the beautiful, balmy city of Minneapolis, Minnesota. A long time ago. <laughs> um, very, uh, you know long. him as, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, I don't like to think about that. Uh, uh, anyway, you know him as uh, the legendary TV's Frank from Mystery Science Theater. He's also a member of uh, The Mads with uh, Trace Ballou that do uh, shows on basically weekly, bi-weekly, it seems like. You guys are cranking them out. And... Uh, one of the uh, one of the one of my oldest dearest friends in comedy, a great stand up comedian, one of the preeminent what would you call it preeminent movie riff specialists, um, yeah, move, movie riffers, you know, yeah. just uh, uh, just happened to be lucky enough to get on that TV show. So that's yeah. one of the things things I do. That's how I felt about Hee Haw Honeys. Um, <laughs> But uh, and you have a new book, which is great. You have a um, uh, a book out called Billy Gillis, seven year old screenwriter, and yes, uh, I do. It, and uh, and you had another book last year that uh, we didn't talk about last time we spoke called Action Packed Apartments. Both of these are available right. uh, through Amazon, Amazon and your other uh, other venues. Please welcome Frank Conniff. 
ladies. Thank and gentlemen. you, Dana. It's great, great to be here. It's great to see you again. You know, I'm living my best pandemic life. So, <laughs> you know, as you used to uh, say, I had Jello today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm uh, getting through and surviving. So, um, uh, so yeah, things are actually are actually good. So. Yeah. No, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, the the, the the pandemic hit like right after your recovery, correct? Like it was not yes, long I was, after your um, recovery. You really got a double whammy. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I had quadruple bypass surgery. And as I look back on it, we I'm should specify that was on your heart. On my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was, uh, they're doing incredible work with taints these days. But, uh, <laughs> uh, he now has but, four taints uh, scattered throughout his uh, body. <laughs> yes. And um, it happened um, like uh, th- actually in a month, it'll be, I think, three years since it happened. And so I was lucky, first of all, that it happened. Uh, uh, well, first of all, that I was able to get the medical help that I got and they did yeah. a phenomenal job and they they fixed me up and and I've been healthy ever since. But also it happened before the pandemic, you know, right. which um, was was. was was lucky for me. And I, I remember you were in New York and my last day in the hospital, you texted me and, and, uh, asked if you could come over and visit. And I was very touched by that. And, and I was, I was just actually leaving the hospital that day, but, um, um, but I've always remembered that. Oh, well, well I'll cut this. I love you, Frank. <laughs> I'll, I'll cut this. <laughs> no, it's yeah. a very, it's a very funny story about the last time I was in New York. Um, and of course, uh, the, the best part about it was that you were leaving the hospital, um, Mm -hmm. on your, under your own power. And, uh, but we, uh, uh, Kat, my, uh, uh, then girlfriend, soon to be, soon to be wife. Um, we were at a wedding of her childhood best friend in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And these, uh, they're all, everyone is from Omaha, Nebraska. And they're all wow. from uh, the Omaha, and a lot of them are in bands uh, that are long-standing bands. And uh, I am an Irish Catholic from Ma- Massachusetts, and I have never seen people drink like oh really wow people, in, people from Omaha, Nebraska in bands. And to that, and on that day, I had a uh, a hangover from being around them. Wow! <laughs> I didn't drink. I had a diet coke and mm-hmm. a couple of club sodas, and I was sick just by seeing the volume of liquor these people took in, which had never oh happened to me before. Yeah, I and I was in comedy. I was in comedy in the eighties. You know, I've right. seen I've seen more drugs and alcohol than the Eagles roadie, and it was <laughs> it was alarming what uh the volume oh that's of, of amazing intake. i never heard of a contact hangover before that's what that's it was amazing. i had a that, but that's perfect for me yeah all the misery and none of the pleasure <laughs> <laughs> second hand uh hangover <laughs> yeah now i want to i want to get into the mads in your life in new york and everything but let's get right to the let's get right to the plug um, how did the mm. idea for uh, for billy gillis seven-year-old screenwriter come in because you wrote a book about you know you 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 and i both are are I you know Matt Weinhold says it best. You know, movies are my football. You know, it's like yeah, this is my no, football. Exactly. This is my this is my perfect. Area. Yeah, as you can yeah. see by my T-shirt, and uh, and you uh, you wrote a uh, you it was a book before uh, apartments. It was um, well, was I a, wrote one a, a few years ago called How to Write Cheesy Movies, which right. was um, which was kind of the um, the um, the alternate universe, the multiverse uh, version of Sid Field's screenplay book. I, I, <laughs> watching all of the the bad films I've watched at Mystery Science Theater, I, I tried to to write a book with the worst screenwriting advice ever. <laughs> you know, if you really wanted to write a really cheesy movie, um, um, I was trying to be helpful in that book. So, um, so that was kind of my advice. Uh, um, how to, but this, this book, and, and um, there was also I, I, the book, the, and also a great book, uh, 25 mystery science theater, 3000 films that changed my life in no way whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was my first book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, that's a so, great, that is a great read. 
Oh, thank you. Twenty five, mi- yeah, twenty five mystery science theater, three thousand films that changed my life in no way whatsoever. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So as you said, you know, um, we're both like just very immersed in movies. So so this book, Billy Gillis, seven year old screenwriter, has has um, a lot of that sensibility is in it but it it really at its at its heart it's i think it's a sweet story it's about a kid whose father is a screenwriter and um he gets uh he actually has a heart attack because it's uh, it's like autobiographical in that sense (laughs) his and his dad is sick and and his dad is like a lot of writers he's always worried about everything and he's always worried about um not having enough money and his career falling apart. And then this happens, and Billy hears his dad talk about how worried, and, and his mom, too, how worried they are about money. And so he, as a seven-year-old kid, um, uh, knowing uh, a little bit about the business from his dad, he decides he's <laughs> going to help his dad by going and by writing a screenplay overnight, by the way. He, <laughs> thinks it, he has the idea, and he writes it, he He's like a young back. Al Adamson. He's just <laughs> <laughs> he writes it overnight, and and then he and his friend Irene, who's like his babysitter, she's a teenager, and she uh, drive can drive him around and stuff. And so they go on this adventure where they try to sell um, <laughs> screenplay, and that you know that's the basic um, uh, premise of it. But uh, you know, uh, I, I had a thought about it after I wrote it. I it wasn't even conscious. Um, because, because I, I wrote this book about this kid who's trying to help his dad, who's had a heart attack. And when I thought about it afterwards, I I really think like Billy kind of, um, he was subconsciously kind of represents to me, like all of my friends and family who, when I was really sick, their, their just priority was to help me and to do whatever they could, you know, and I was very overwhelmed by that. And, and, like I said, I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote it, but afterwards I thought, That's I really felt it, that there was a lot yeah. of that in it. Everything you write comes out. Like everything I ended up, for years, everything I was writing, I was like, oh, this is about my dad. <laughs> like, yeah, you exactly, wrote, yeah. Yeah, and I just wrote a, a feature, uh, and when I was done writing it, I was like, oh, I didn't realize this is my divorce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. It just comes through and it becomes, yes. you don't it's have to called, sit down and write and write an autobiography. It's called Faster Her to... Attorney, Kill, Kill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to see that. Um, um, yeah, you know, even if you don't set out to write an autobiographical story, it becomes your 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 life comes through it. You yeah. Know? The, my, my, the best story of that, and I've told it on this podcast before, is in Stephen King's On Writing. Where he says, I, I wrote great this book. book. Called, I've read that book. Such a great book. And he talks about, yeah. I wrote this book, The Langoliers, about these aliens that come down from Earth and they make people smarter and sharper and more athletic. And the only thing it is, you die a lot sooner. And the first sign of your decrepitude is you start having uncontrollable nosebleeds. He goes, I didn't realize until long after I written the book, like, oh, I was writing about my cocaine habit. <laughs> like, it just never occurred to oh, me. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's, it's really interesting how that, uh, how that happens. Clearly, you had a heart attack, and then you write a book about a heart attack. Right. Yeah, that, there's going to be the connection there. And I love what you said. It's true, is that, you put yourself, you're not in Billy's position. You put yourself mm-hmm. in the father's position and then you're, it symbolizes what people did for you. Um, right, how, right. How did you handle for an all ages book, the dad having a heart attack? Does it happen after the event or? Oh no, it happens. Um, uh, I actually, you know, it's funny, much. I didn't really think about that. If, uh, you know, that sounds I, like I, a children's book that I yeah. would write. It starts in an orgy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like if you wrote a children's book, and I'm the same way. Like I, I you know, you, uh, I, I, I try to keep certain things about my sensibility in check. Like I didn't go too dark, right? But oh, uh, uh, but well, that's um, where we differ. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> book that oh kid yeah, then yeah. It's because I didn't. He he just kind of um. He just kind of has the heart attack, but it's not it's not gra- graphic right. or anything. It's not. Um, 
you know, I didn't milk all the comedy I could have out of. Well, there are children's books like when dad goes to prison and things like that. Yeah, there are. There are uh, dark uh, things like that. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And uh, we chuckle. uh, We chuckle heartily. I, (laughs) I felt like the whole thing i was i was keeping it pretty light you know and although his i love the adventure after the adventure after is having to sell a screen yeah (laughs) and and but 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 even through all that like billy one thing that i made clear was billy is is traumatized by his dad's um Mm -hmm. condition and and it 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 um it colors like everything everything he does but um uh but when he when he gets to the um, when he goes to the uh, studio and he meets these producers and and it, it and it isn't realistic in terms of the way s- things are pitched and um, because they they just sit and and they read his screenplay while Billy is sitting there, which <laughs> which I know doesn't happen in in real life, but but I I have to say I was the structure of this book was very influenced by the uh wc fields movie never give a sucker an even break which uh-huh, i don't right. know if you've seen, but of course that has wc fields going into a studio with a script and franklin pangborn the studio head or the producer reading the screenplay and then you in the movie you go and you see the screenplay he's reading and then every now and then it it cuts back to Franklin Pangborn going, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever read. You know, as it's just well, this complete ab- absurdist story. I'm going um, I'm to mark the time here that the seal on Franklin's Pangborn references was broken. It's still okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, of course, I said it, assuming everyone's going to know who Franklin Pangborn is. Which if they don't, they should. But... Um, <laughs> So, so that was, of course, that, we that, all know that, who Arnold, we saw him at Arnold Stang Fest last year, his last, <laughs> last appearance. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, th- that kind of influenced the structure of the book because it's you great. see scenes, you see Billy's screenplay, which in the book is written in crayon and is, is written in orange that's crayon. Great. Um, and then, you know, There'll be like a page or two of that, and then it cuts back to the producers just going, "What is this? This is like the craziest thing I've ever read." <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, uh, and I'm assuming, uh, and and so, and is this illustrated? Like I haven't, I have not seen the book yet. Is this, um, it's uh, um, uh, the the cover is done by Len Peralta, who's a great artist who's done the covers for all my books, and he does a lot of stuff for other for Trace Blue and other Mystery mm-hmm. Science Theater people. Um, but, and then he also, uh, did the crayon screenplay writing in the book. Uh, you know, he, he, right. I, I wanted there to be like a little bit of a flourish but, to that, but it's not, yeah, but, is but, the book, that's, but the, the book's not illustrated book, it, like a kid's book. It's not illustrated. No, it's, yeah. it's like, it's like 99 pages, you know, it's a very yeah. quick read. Oh, that's fantastic. That, that yeah. and when did this, when, what, what motivated you to start writing, uh, start writing, uh, books? Was it just literally trapped in your house? Um, well, I mean, I, well, no, I because started, 25 films came out first that came out. Yeah. I mean, pandemic. I started, I started, um, writing and publishing my own books, um, about six or seven years ago. And, um, um, I, I just think it's a, a great activity once you've been, uh, once you've become washed up as a TV comedy writer, it's just a great way to, uh, I didn't see you at the meeting. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, no, I mean I was I was in New York and 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 I came up with the idea for the Mystery Science Theater book and and the great thing about that too was I knew there'd be like an audience for it, right. you know, and so yeah, it just was the kind of thing I could um, I could write and publish myself, and I knew people would buy it and read it, so that kind of started it off, and then I just um, uh, I just kept kept writing and and kept. Um, if I came up with an idea for a book, I, you know, I, I would try to bring it to, to yeah, the no. final trimester, you know, and uh, get it. An get interesting it choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, you and Dan Spencer and John Schwartzwelder are uh, three uh, three friends of mine that do it, and it's yeah, uh, I, it's I read that. I, I I didn't know that about John Schwartz. 
Schwarzwelder, but I read that in the article about him and I was... Yeah, the I time, I think it's called the time think. machine did it, is mm-hmm. it literally like giant, out, giant laugh, like a- external, oh, I bet. sitting I, alone, I, reading, laughing out loud. Mm. every page i mean it's yeah, just yeah i've i've i've, I've got to get that and, and and i was when when i saw when i read that he does that i, I felt very validated that i do it you know yeah, yeah. If someone like him like he is if john schwarzwelder is doing it then it's it's it, it makes sense for well there's for no difference there's no well. difference between that and being an independent filmmaker it's the same thing exactly yeah it's the same or, or exact all, thing, all yeah, the, yeah I, i'm putting stuff out uh and we live in a uh, it's just taking advantage of, and, and I'm I'm no good at technology, but yet I am taking advantage of the technological age we live in, the do-it-yourself age we live in, where we can all just put out our own uh, product, either putting out books if we want, or becoming a TikTok star if you yeah. could, you know. Yeah, the gatekeep. I mean, the gatekeepers are the people that took the biggest hit, and uh, there's yeah. no, I have no problem with that. <laughs> Yeah, no, not yeah. at all, not at yeah. all. It is, uh, I mean, as people that were stand-up com, as people on our stand-up comics, that and you and I came up in the in the eighties, um, right. getting on the Tonight Show or getting on Letterman was the holy grail. Like if mm-hmm. we just and then the, and so then the focus of your life became whoever booked comedy. On right. either show, it was Bob Morton or Jim McCauley or whoever it was mm-hmm. at the time. And now that is utterly meaningless. It is. You yeah. Know, I mean, it's, it's great to get a spot on those shows, but it, it's, it's not the be all end all that it was. And, and the, the yeah, no, it's funny. really successful comedians, they're, they're doing a lot of different things in it's, a lot of different it's, ways. It's YouTube and podcasts and it, you know, that's where, that's where the comedy audience is. Um, yeah, I know when I go on the road, uh, it's 99% of people is like, I love your podcast or I love you on this podcast or that podcast. Right. Uh, right. it's never like, you know, saw you on, saw you, uh, saw you on TV for five minutes at one thirty in the morning. Like nobody says that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> nobody says, yeah. Loved you on premium blend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Saw you on comedy on the road. I hear they're being colorized. Uh, <laughs> Kenny Rogerson joke about his first, he said to Bob Morton, Bob, I understand my first Letterman shots being colorized. <laughs> um, and you're still doing, you're still very active in stand up too. And uh, yeah, you- I haven't done a lot um, um, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, but my, actually my first show back was at a club called QED in Queens and, uh, there were six people in the audience. So I was very encouraged to see <laughs> my following back to pre pandemic levels. <laughs> yeah, hit the ground, ru- hit the ground strolling. <laughs> yeah. Actually at the height of the pandemic, the, the, the mayor said, um, Everyone has to lock down, but it's still okay to go to Frank Connor's shows. Yeah, you'll be, there's you'll a lot be fine. of there's always but pl- always plenty of social distancing. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a COVID sellout, as we like to yeah. say. <laughs> um, do you still do you still go out? I mean, well, so let's talk about the Mads and stand up and 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 go forward. Uh, you and Trace Ballou, who is uh, 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 from MST. Um, mm-hmm. I'm I'm blanking on Trace's Clayton Forrester. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. TV's Frank and Clayton Forrester from, uh, from MST. You have your own, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what you would call it, uh, Endeavor? Well, it's, yeah, it's a monthly, um, uh, just a monthly, I, I use the old-fashioned term broadcast, you know, it's a mm-hmm. monthly broadcast on live streaming, um, or once a month, Trace and I do a whole new riff of, of a movie, um, and, um, you know, and next next month will actually be our two year anniversary of doing these shows. We will have done twenty four shows. Oh, so and, they're monthly. Um, it's monthly. Monthly, yeah. And um, it's really amazing because, and it's another thing, uh, you know, where I count myself as so lucky because, um, you know, Trace and I before this we were we were out on the road doing maybe two shows a month and and doing you know um, getting by on that and doing well. And we had our merch table and everything and, um, and it was really fun and great, but then that all went away 
um, with the pandemic. And, you know, we're, we're two old guys who know nothing about technology. And, and, you know, I was like, well, maybe we could try to, I don't know, maybe there's some way to do it as a, as an online show. And I, I talked to my friend, uh, Chris Gershbeck, uh, mm-hmm. who's, who's great at this kind of thing. And, you know, it took him a, a couple of days to figure it out, but, uh, finally he said, well, this is how you can do it. And then we started doing these monthly digital shows and they've been tremendously successful, you know, more successful than the live shows because uh-huh. we can, everybody, everybody all over the country can, can tune in, you know, right. um, and, um, and it's, it's just it's been three, like, I it's said, it three windows on your screen. It's you uh, and Trace it's, in the film. No, it's, we, we just, um, we start out, it's like a zoom meeting where we right. talk, but, but then we, um, go to the, just uh, the film and your audio, just, just, just the, uh, screen and, and just our voices. And, um, and, you know, we had you on, you know, we have a Q and a guest. We had, right. we had you on for one of the shows and, um, so you, you hit know, the, bo- just, you hit the bottom of the barrel early. <laughs> uh yes and um and it it's just um uh it's just been very successful and i feel so lucky because my you know my income went away completely and then it, it came back and you know so when you guys do the mads is it like mystery uh science theater was in that you do you watch it and write like i know that mst is very scripted yeah, uh, and the the yeah, brilliance we, of, the brilliance of it was that it seemed improvised, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, so how do you guys approach the Mads? Because I know when we did Plan Nine, we were far too lazy to. Well, we you know, improvised shows can be can be great when they're live. You know, there's yeah. uh, there's there can be a great energy, and 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 there was those shows we did with you. Um, uh, there was some great stuff that came out of that but trace and i script we both write separate scripts um and then we get together and we Pick and, and we have a rehearsal and call it but 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 it's 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 we keep it pretty loose though you know yeah. it's scripted but but there's always room for for ad living and you know right right yeah it's good to it's good to be to to i don't know what it is but the ad lib stuff just has an energy that is indefinable uh, yeah, or, yeah. or undefinable, I guess would be the word. Um, and you can, yeah, you can just tell. And it, it mm. has an energy. I know on hanging with Dr. Z, the little YouTube thing I do, that mm. the, the stuff that's riffed, you can, you can just, it just has an energy to it that you can't, mm-hmm. you can't double. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really really fun to do it that way. Yeah. And how do you guys uh are the movies movies that you had done on MST or are there new movies that you find? Well, it's mostly newer movies um that we haven't done before, although we've done a couple of uh we revisited uh, Manos the Hands of Fate. Sure. Now, aren't you and, the one that uh, sort of found that movie? Yes. I'm uh um, you found Manos Hands of Fate, and I found the video of the guy hitting the heckler over the head with his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Which I remember seeing that and enjoying. I remember you brought that to Minneapolis. Yeah, that's I've my... said this before. <laughs> I, I've said this before. I think uh, a couple of times uh, of before the internet, um, there was Dana Gould and Eddie Gordetsky. You know. <laughs> it's really just true. coming over to your house with tapes and stuff. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I was trying to explain that to some younger comments. Like, I found that. That's mine. Yeah. I'm looking like the death of a stand, death of a headliner. I write. I mean something. <laughs> Well, that might be my ultimate claim to infamy: is that I found that was the hands of fate. Not, I think nothing to sneeze at. Well. It, I I'm always afraid it's going to be a thing like I'm going to be like uh, Carlo in um, The Godfather. You know, you have to answer for what you've done, Carlo. <laughs> you have to answer for Santino. Uh, um, but uh, 
Um, yeah, I, and so we, and then, and then our, our last show that we just did Tuesday night was, uh, the brain that wouldn't die, which was, which right. we had done on the science theater, but we did a whole new riff of it. And, um, it was really fun. It's a, that is an underrated movie. That is an underrated is. movie. And boy, that woman's mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's, she's justified, you know? Uh, yeah. And I also <laughs> like this. I also like in the brain that wouldn't die. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a severed head on a tray that's alive, but we need something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about a monster in a room? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, can, I, I, I thought about the what's last the time kitten, I watched What's the kicker here? <laughs> and I just watched it. My, I, I, I mean, I didn't see that movie like when I was 10 years old on Chiller Theater, but if I had, I would have loved it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. George Meyer was always was always just kind of like, God, that woman's, she's so mean. <laughs> she, she lives in a tray. <laughs> well, that's also another thing is, is if his plan succeeds and he puts her head on another body and she goes, their relationship is still over. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem like they're going to come back from this. It's, you know? it's not like, okay, reset. <laughs> <laughs> Because she yeah. completely changes in the movie. Uh, she's like a, a very subservient, uh, like totally in love with him. Yeah. And then when she's the severed head, she's like. She's, yeah, she becomes not, Tura Satana real quick. Yeah, exactly. Which, understand again, understandable. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we just did a live read out here uh, of I Married a Monster from Outer Space. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, I saw that you were doing that. Which is interesting in that the 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 woman who is from Earth actually behaves less like a real person than the impersonator from outer space. Oh really? <laughs> it is it's it is one of those things like, you know, there's such a thing as a second draft. You can <laughs> you, <laughs> you can give this a read and fix mm -hmm. stuff. Totally legal. Um, yeah, that was in, in our life. So I kept going, I'm going to remind you, she is the human in the relationship. <laughs> uh, are there, do you go, do you get to go to the movies now? Have you been out to the movies? I know there's, I, uh, you're in the New York only, and there's COVID and, uh, yeah, the only things I've seen in a the theater were, um, um, uh, believe it or not, I saw the Nick Cage movie Pig in a movie theater, uh, uh -huh. which I thought was a really good movie. I did too. I saw um, I saw it here in on uh, uh, in my house, but I thought it was great. Yeah. I, thought he, I thought he was great, and you go, oh, he can still oh, he's, he's play a person. Yeah. <laughs> he can still play a person <laughs> because um, they do. Those actors get you get like Al Pacino went through it. Nicholas, K where they become Vincent Price, where right. it's just whispering and screaming. Mm -hmm. And uh and yeah. then yeah, and then you saw well, also like, oh. I, I I think part of um Nicolas Cage's career is um he had a big monthly a monthly nut that he had to make. And so his his criteria for being in a movie was can you meet his quote? Okay. Yeah. You met my quote, I will be in your movie. And but but at the same time he he did smaller things too that were that were good. But uh yeah. that's what happens uh, when but, you have a castle. Yes, exactly. Um, but uh, I saw that. I saw the James Bond movie uh, in a theater. Um, and Which I, I loved I, until I hated. Oh, yeah. I You know what? I my, it, And it's funny, too. You and I, I don't know if you remember, we saw um, Skyfall we in did, Minneapolis. We did, yes. Yeah, in Minneapolis, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, to me, I, I felt like it was a solid... James Bond movie, but I, I wasn't bowled over by it by or anything. Oh, just like you know, to, I, to me, and this is like the the ending of the movie mm -hmm. is like it's it, it's not heavy drama, right? S stop, you know it's it's like this. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Better Things. It's just it's purportedly a comedy, and there are forty five minute shots of people looking at a stop sign and feeling. It's like stop, <laughs> you're not. This isn't drama. This is a cartoon. You know, right, it can be right. a good, it can be a good cartoon and, yeah. and, and, and enjoyable, but don't make this what it, don't make this more than it is. You know, it's right. like, you know, there's a reason that 
when Godzilla walks through Tokyo, they don't cut to women going, my baby. Oh my God, my <laughs> baby's dead. No, because it's exactly. just a kid's Godzilla. <laughs> you, yeah. You're not far off. Stop. Mm. You know? Um, yeah. I think that's a great point. And I, and I think too, that, um, you know, and the Daniel Craig movies have, have been mostly good. I think. Yeah. And but, I think he's great. And I, yeah, and I always go great. and yeah, I, you but, know, but I, but there's, it's, it's the modern age of, of screenwriting where there has to be a character arc. There has to be a personal journey on the part of the protagonist. Whereas the Sean Connery movies where, it was a cool guy who saved the world. You yeah, know, you that, go on that a mission. And, yeah, if, if, they yeah. Make, if they make King Kong today, you uh, know, the, it's like he would have been like King Kong was a baby and he was raised with a guy that built the Empire State Building and they were brothers together and then they had a falling yeah. out and his goal in life was to get on the Empire State Building and beat it up. You know, it's like everything has to yeah. be personal. James uh -huh. Bond, you know, Bl Blofeld and Bond have to be childhood friends when push the other yeah, out, I know. Oh, when push the other out of the other crib. Movie. It's like, fuck no! That it doesn't have to be like that. That whole Bullfield thing in Spectre was like, talk about overthinking things, you know? Yeah. Well, I think oh. you blame George Lucas also for that. Like, every, it's uh, like, oh no, Darth Vader. Like, it, you know, like, if you, if you believe the Star Wars prequels, when, when the Millennium, uh, by the way, I'll get off this because I, I know how I sound. <laughs> I, I know how I sound. When the, you believe the Star Wars prequels, the Millennium Falcon gets drawn into the Death Star. It can, it, on board are his son, his daughter, and the robot he built as a child from scratch. <laughs> and the only thing he thinks, he, but the only he senses his old buddy Obi Wan Kenobi. That's the only thing he picks up on. It's like every everyone you know is in the same boat, and it oh just came God. into where you I are. never, I never thought of that before. Yeah, yeah. That's you think crazy. you'd be like, "Where's three PO? I haven't seen him in a long time. I'd love to see him." <laughs> Has he gained oh weight? How's God. he doing? <laughs> <laughs> he sees C three PO and he's like, "This guy, I can't believe it. This guy, this nut." <laughs> like, yeah, every everything has to be. Yeah, you can't just have a. There's no such thing as a random occurrence. Everything is fate. Right. Everything comes from yeah, fate. Yeah, everything is just uh, backstory, and you know, it, yeah. it just um, it's it's um, like when they do franchises now. Um, I, I I forget. Oh, I I saw the picture of the new of the next Willy Wonka movie, um, or is it Willy Wonka or um, with Timothy Chalamet? Um, and they said, "Well, we're going to find." I don't know if it was this character. It was like. We're going to find out about his childhood and how he got to it. It's like, who cares? Who cares? You know? Well, they did that in the yeah. Burton one thing. Oh, no, his father yeah. wouldn't let him eat candy. Oh, <laughs> well, then now it's explained. Yeah. Because Lord knows I need these things explained. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I, I have to know why, once upon a why is there a Spider Man? Why? It, yeah, yeah, it just drives me. I'm, I didn't know Timothy Chalamet. I do like that Timothy Chalamet went to the Academy Awards without a shirt on. Mm -hmm. Just wore a jacket, and he must have been thinking, "I'm going to be the talk of the Oscars." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wop 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 wop. <laughs> always, you can always count on crazy people. Um, I'll tell you the movie that I saw that I thought was great. Uh huh. Was Everything Everywhere All at Once? I'm um, I'm hearing nothing but great things about that. Uh, that's, it's basically that's if Terry Gilliam made Kung Fu Hustle. Mm -hmm. great what a, that sounds sounds awesome yeah, yeah yeah if you don't love it i'd like to know <laughs> and yeah uh, yeah and i yeah and I it's went great to see... too that it's it's like people are going to the theater to see it you know like it's like it's a non-franchise movie that people are excited about yeah that nobody thing. wanted to go near i mean everything yeah. about everything about it is great nobody wanted to make it there are no stars in it everybody mm -hmm. thought it was and it's not a franchise you know there's not the everything everywhere all at once universe and now we're gonna do mm -hmm. now we're gonna do a whole separate run of films about that one guy sitting at the desk in that one scene now he has his own um, but to that end, I also went to see Doctor Strange with my uh, daughter, and uh, <clears throat> we loved it. My daughter, is, my daughter is 13. She's in love with Tom Holland, so she's very much mm -hmm. into the Marvel, uh, to the MCU, okay. uh, to the MCU now. And uh, so I, uh, I'm catching up on the uh, MCU, mm -hmm. and uh, that's fine. 
I'm a fan. In yeah. general, I'm a fan. The Avengers uh, movies, I've, I like to have one scene where the ground is parallel to the ground. Like, not, not every angle should be a Dutch angle in the movie. There can be a mm-hmm. scene where a guy just walks into a room, and if it's really good. Cool. Yeah. And it's, I still get, I mean, I, I guess it is in that regard, like football, I still get such pleasure, like, going to the movies and if it the movie's great i get i'm so happy i'm just like that yeah, was yeah yeah it's, yeah, it's uh, a great uh, great thing yeah yeah it's in it and you're i especially out i was not after the pandemic because we're still in it um but uh just to be around people laughing at the same thing mm-hmm. you know yeah and, and it's not me you know it's like just to be a part just yeah. to be a part of the audience anyway um do you still do you still do i find here in la even with me it goes in fits and starts, you yeah. know, it's like you get a lot and then it, and I didn't, get, I, I have to and, say, I didn't, uh, in New York in the summer of the lockdown, there was like a lot of outdoor stand up shows happening. Mm-hmm. And I went Carl Schurz park, which is right next to where I live. I went for a walk there on a nice day. And there was these young people doing a stand up show. I didn't know any of them. And in a public park, doing filthy material <laughs> i'm like oh my god you yeah know. i'm uh do you know sam morell I, I know who that is yeah i became friends with him uh and uh he so i kind of know what's going on in the new york scene uh, like but, but and yeah he did he did a he did a special of just his out his roof shows during, uh, the, during the pandemic but i actually thought that, that was i mean outdoor shows suck uh yeah and they're but in a controlled situation like a roof it, it can be fine where it can, there's just an yeah. audience in, I, in front of you i've done uh, this was even before the pandemic there was like a a backyard show in brooklyn that was outdoors and it was great yeah i've i've done them and now they're i'm used to them it's always better to be in a basement with a low roof is the is the yeah. ideal place for comedy mm-hmm. but um uh but i've done but i i did think it was interesting in the pandemic in lockdown that no people like like grass growing through the sidewalk. Like people needed to have this experience. People wanted to be together, witnessing something outside their house. Ha- you know, right. ma- people are mammals, and mammals are social. And uh, we're not we're not built for, you know, uh, multi year. Yeah, isolation. Uh, solitary isolation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless, unless you're a comedian. Then unless you're a comedian. Completely... Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that was the thing. It was like, it was so, you know, I've been, I'm a comedian. I've been socially distancing since 1984. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's very true. And it, believe me, and I'm sure you're the same way. I have to force myself to just like, no, go out to don't. Yeah. Then, yeah. Oh. I, I I can't say I have to force myself. I, I'll say I will force myself when the yeah. time comes because yeah, it yeah, yeah. happens very rarely. And I'm in I am in a high risk group and everything too. And I'm I'm vaccinated and everything, but right. and boosted. But right, I'm and you have not. You've end. never gotten it, right? No, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, get me it. neither. I know a lot of people. You know, so it's it's hard. Me to too. Think. I know a ton of people. Yeah, it's hard to think that it, the pandemic o- is over when. The mayor of my city, the governor of my state, and the vice president of the United States all have it. You yes. Know? Yeah. No, it's, it's, I know right now, I know th- three people that have it currently. Yeah. Uh, and uh, two of them are in New York. Uh, <laughs> Frank, run. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, and I don't, does it go, isn't it supposed to go away at some point? Does it go away at some point? I don't it? know. I mean, it's, it's, um, I mean, I read conflicting things about it every day. I'm, I'm, um, even though I'm on, I'm, I'm on a podcast right now, so I should be an expert on this kind of thing, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. Though, Whatever you want to be the truth. <laughs> even though I'm on a podcast at this very moment, I'm not going to, uh, present myself as having any expertise on this at all. <laughs> I like the podcast where people talk about how we should burn it all down as if that's not happening. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed or seen a paper lately. So last night, um, we saw the first part of the documentary George Carlin's American Dream. 
which is right, a right. HBO multi-part documentary. And I'm obsessed with Carlin and I know, or I thought I knew the whole story. It's a, it's a really great documentary. They did a great job. Um, and you know, you can see him towards the end of his life as he got more and more cynical and also more and more prescient. I mean, they're showing stuff from his specials in the nineties right. that is about today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you yeah. it's just he nailed it to the wall on everything. It's mm-hmm. freakish. He predicted all of this. And he would say that, you know, when you're born in this world, you get a ticket to the freak show. And if you're an American, you have a front row seat. And mm. and basically he fig- he would say, like, well, America, we're circling the drain now. We're just arguing over the speed. And I want to not believe that, but I, every day I'm like, no, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see, you see it in, in our, in our occupation, everybody's making fear-based decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're afraid, you want an authoritarian leader to tell you what to do and to tell you everything is yeah. going to be okay. And, you know, and the, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know what other time period you could equate to this. I, I said 2020 was like 1968. Like mm-hmm. it was just like everything fell apart at the same time. <laughs> right. And, uh, but it, I don't feel like it's swing it's taking a step forward. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to be, um, to be hopeful. I, I, I make a, a an effort to be, I, I just know that like, um, what we're going through has been really hard, but it's not, it's not unprecedented in history for people to have to endure this kind of thing. We, we just didn't think it would happen here, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, well put. And, you know, people who, people who lived in London during the Blitz, you know, I mean, um, I, I see scenes of, um, in movies of, um, I was watching some old movie the other day and, and it took place in London during the Blitz and people are just going about their business and digging ditches and creating shelters and like nobody is is like they're just taking it as their lot in life that they have to endure something um, that's a total drag, you know, where it's... Yeah, well, that's where Keep Calm we, and we, Carry we, On We, we came live from, in a yeah. time where people had to put... a piece of cloth over their nose and <laughs> it, was an it was it was there was a huge rebellion against it and they they felt like they were being oppressed and um you know so it, in a way we're kind of america we're the victim of our own comfort and uh, that we've a- achieved in the past oh yeah a hundred percent as someone said the other day is not mine but like uh, you know the the court will not force a 15 year old girl to wear a mask to school but they will force her to have a rapist's baby. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And you can't argue. I mean, I'm just like... Yeah, I had the thought the other day, you know, when there's all this stuff about Elon Musk taking it over, and I'm like, oh my God, um, uh, Twitter might be ruined, and <laughs> I might yeah. have to get off it and go outside just as the weather is getting really nice. <laughs> this couldn't have happened at a worse time. Yeah. Asshole to take over toilet. There's your headline. <laughs> yeah, and you just keep doing your crap. You know, Goldthwait, I was talking to Bobcat Goldthwait, who I toured with a lot in, yeah. before the pandemic. Um, and it was the height of the the previous presidency and, and all of that storm and drama. Mm-hmm. And, and Bob was like, I feel like a Joel Gray in Cabaret. You know, he's like, the Nazis are marching outside. We're like, the girls are beautiful. <laughs> hey, look at me. Everything is great. Things could be better. But you know what we did? It is like a very, and people take it for granted. It, it, it is a great thing that we elected a new president. You know what I mean? It's huge. And that we, it's huge. And, yeah. and, that, and, and as much as it sucks that it isn't a bigger majority that we got more Democrats in Congress. And, and so, you know, we're push, pushing the shit show back, not nearly as much as we want, but, you know, but the people who, who went out and canvassed and got the vote out um, and did all that stuff, I mean, those are like really positive people doing really positive yeah, things and, that and are that, really, and really that's, making a difference And in the that's world. the thing that makes a difference. 
Yeah. That's the thing that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Bitching, bitching on Twitter doesn't do shit. That there's a difference between the political culture and culture. And right. in culture, things have made tremendous strides forward. Uh, people complain about wokeism, but mm -hmm. it's great that yeah. we have become hyper aware of people that have had the shit end of the stick mm -hmm. for centuries. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's great. And that gay people can get married is great. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that we're aware of those things. Those are all positives. It's the pushback against it by the people who don't like not being the top of the food chain automatically right. that mm -hmm. we that we are living through. And in the end, it is doomed, but it takes a long time <laughs> to get there. But you <laughs> but you can't stop progress. Right. You cannot yeah. stop progress. And it is progress. And comedians have to realize too that it is a good thing that that a a group like trans people or or gay people or 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 um or people of color that that couldn't fight back against bullying for for decades that now they have a voice and yeah. if they if they don't like that they're being unfairly maligned that that there's there's a community of them to speak up and and that's that's a good thing you know a hundred percent and and yeah, yeah it's it's you know in a, a lot a long time you know even, you know, there are things that I've done in specials that, as the old, couldn't do today. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like, yeah, at the time, I didn't, to, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. You know? And then that's what awareness is, is becoming mm -hmm. aware. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with becoming aware. And, you know, it's, uh, and uh, it's, you cannot call yourself a progressive if you don't allow people to progress. Exactly. And, and the world, the world changes, you know, culture changes. And, um, I saw one, uh, documentary about the comedy store and, and, and a lot of the comedians that were on it were complaining about wokeism. You can't make fun of anybody and you can't, you can't say this, you can't say that. And to me, they just sounded like the old comics when I was a kid. Yeah. The old cat skills guys. Ah, oh, the kids today with their language, they're never going to get anywhere with that. A hundred percent. You know, dirty language. And it's, it's no good anymore. It's, it's, it's like when you're older, like I am, I'm like officially an old guy now. Like, um, when you're complaining about, um, about newer things happening and culture changing, uh, you're part of a tradition of history that's always been wrong. Yeah, but you can complain about, oh, I can't make fun of these people now. All yeah. I see is Bob Hope and Jack Benny making fun of the Beach Boys. That's, exactly. that's all I see. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. no, I still want to be with the Beach Boys. Yeah. If you watch old um, uh, hey, Bob Hank Hope specials. Hey, Hank 10, huh? Um, I, there's, I saw an old Bob Hope special and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this joke, but it's pretty close to what he said. He's like, Hey, how about the, the Beatles? Uh, they, they sound like Hermione Gingold having a stroke, you know? <laughs> well, that's and like I said, that's a paraphrase, but it did have the Beatles and Hermione Gingold in the joke. It's, my... And people don't remember like up, uh, up until 1967, the Beatles were a punchline, right? Like up until really Sergeant Pepper, the Beatles were a punch. The Beatles, you know, it, it was just like, it was like, you just doubled it. Nope. They're not going, they're going away tomorrow. Okay. Next year, they're going away next year. <laughs> <laughs> they nope. were a fly by night. It's not music yeah. that lasts, which is what all the old Tin Pan Alley people said. Yeah. It, it doesn't have any lasting value. Now, here we are like 60 years later. Um, it's amazing. You know, they're still beloved, not just by our generation, but by younger generation. Yeah. There's a weird thing I can tell you that children yeah. love the Beatles automatically. I yeah, don't know yeah. what it is. It is, mm -hmm. there is something weirdly magical that mm -hmm. kids. Absolutely. My daughter, one of her favorite songs to go to bed to was Blackbird. Uh-huh. Oh, know? yeah. Yeah. Don't, can't explain it. Can't explain totally. it. Totally. Um, the book is Billy. Billy Gillis. I was going to say Billy Gates. Screenwriter. Gonna say, I was going to say Billy Gates again for some reason. The book is Billy <laughs> Gillis, seven-year-old screenwriter. You can get it on Amazon or you could, can you get it through frankconniff.com? No, not yet. Um, okay. 
that will happen at some point. But Amazon, or as my friends in England say, Amazon. Yes. Get Amazon. So, um, so yeah, you can get it at Amazon and 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 tune in uh, one, uh, first Tuesday of every month for the Mads. Grace, Bill, you and I, the Mads are back. We do a uh, new, all new riff every month, and um, you can find that at Eventbrite.com or or the Mads are back dot com. The Mads are back dot com, yeah. and that yeah. list what's coming up or. Uh, yeah, we have we haven't picked our movie for the next one, but um, uh, it will be some kind of not very good movie. I promise. <laughs> Where will you find one? <laughs> um, super cool, Frank Conniff. Great to see you, buddy. Thank you. Great to be here. An honor. <laughs> Other podcasts reach for the sky. David Goldbaum. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me, peace out, boom.